Hello. On behalf of Humanities Tennessee, welcome to this session of the Southern Festivals in conversation with Simon Van Boy and Ed Tarkington. My name is Lynn Newcomb, and I will be the host for this session. I'm a volunteer, and this is about my sixth time as session and host. You too can volunteer for the festival and meet the authors and be a part of the team that produces what I like to call the best event in Nashville. For this session, if you're joining us live on Facebook um, Live or YouTube, please post your questions in the comments section at any time. Uh, one from the festival staff will pass those along to me and we'll discuss them with the authors. Uh, we only have about 45 minutes with the authors, so don't wait too long. Uh, before we get started, I'd also thank the festival's key sponsors, Metro Nashville Arts Commission, the Content Group, Tennessee Arts Commission, Vanderbilt University, and Parnassus Books. Humanities Tennessee staff will place links to buy the books for this and every session at the top of the chat. Your purchases of the book via Parnassus will help to keep the book free. The Southern Festival of Books is a free nonprofit event that is supported in part by donations. If you care to support it and keep it free, you can make a donation through the festival app or online at humtn.org. Ed Tarkington's latest novel is Ones, and it's receiving a great praise and even bigger to The Great Gatsby. His debut novel, Only Pick Your Heart, was an ABA Indies Introduced Selection, an Indie Next Pick, a Book of the Month Club Main Selection, and a Southern Indie Booksellers Association bestseller. A regular contributor to Chapter16.org, his articles, essays, and stories have appeared in a variety of publications, including the Nashville Scene, Memphis Commercial Appeal, Knoxville News Sentinel, and Lit Hub. He lives here in Nashville, Tennessee. Simon Van Boy is the award-winning and best-selling author of 15 books that include Night Came With Many Stars, The Secret Lives of People in Love, Love Begins in Winter, Everything Beautiful Began After, The Illusion of Separateness, Tales of Accidental Genius, Father's Day, and The Sadness of Beautiful Things. Two novels for children, Gertie Milk and the Keeper of Lost Things and Gertie Milk and the Great Keeper, along with three anthologies of philosophy, Why We Fight, why Our Decisions Don't Matter, and Why We Need Love. He has written for the New York Times, the Financial Times, the Guardian, the Times, National Public Radio, and BBC, and the Chinese edition of L, which is very interesting. Um, so welcome, Ed and Simon. Um, so you. glad to have you here. Um, Ed, so you are you live here in Nashville, and Simon, is this your... Uh, have you been to the festival before or is this only in dreams <laughs> wonderful well we're glad to have you both here and um we were talking a little bit before that we'll be glad hopefully next year that we'll be back in person and not um on, that we're very fortunate to have this streaming service but we'll be glad to be back um on the plaza um so uh we talked about uh which which one of you would like to to start and read a little from your your uh, book this afternoon? Uh, Simon, you want to start reading from uh, uh, Night Came with Many um, Stars? Can I borrow that, please, Lynn? Oh, I, sure. I, I, Here you go. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's, um, it's yeah. It's nice to be here with with. Um, everybody and definitely with Ed, whose books are fantastic. Um, and Lynn, thank you for volunteering and it's lovely to see. You. And uh, I can't see everybody out there, but I know you're there. So um, hello. Um, so I will read now a little bit from my book. Um, you know, just a short, like, you know, 120 minute excerpt. Um, let's see. So uh, don't worry, I'm joking. I don't, don't log off. Um, I'll, I'll read from page 152. Um, and this chapter is Heather, uh, and it's every chapter is a sort of a different person in some ways. Um, so this Heather, 1999, I'll read for about, you know, two, three minutes. An hour before closing, 
the restaurant already empty. Heather went from table to table, turning over clean coffee cups one by one, then laying down paper placemats. When that was done, she sat at the counter and wrapped silverware in paper napkins, fastening each bundle with a sticker. Her feet hurt, but she'd soon be in the car or going home. She could take her shoes off then and drive barefoot through the darkness. It was Halloween night and the dining room was decorated with ghosts, ghouls and witches' hats. Alone with empty tables, Heather wondered if they were real ghosts and if they watched people. She once found an envelope when cleaning out a cupboard in the supply closet. It was a pack of photographs from New Year's Eve 1957. When she saw the people in those pictures, Heather knew their lives had come and gone. Those who had lived out their days in the town would now be in the cemetery with tiny snapping American flags in the ground over where they were buried. The waitresses in the photographs had matching green dresses. The men wore dark suits or overalls, carried burning cigarettes. Many years ago, there had been a factory and the town was prosperous. Heather wondered if the people in the pictures sensed their time of abundance would pass, or did every day seem new and unbreakable? The hardest thing about getting old, a customer once warned her, was always being shocked by the face staring back at you in the mirror. When Marvin appeared from the kitchen, he was wearing a satin Louisville Cardinals jacket over his baggy kitchen wires. He was a tall, deliberate man with a confident, slow way of speaking. He carried several white containers in a plastic bag, most likely French fries for his children. In his other hand was a box of menthol cigarettes and a plastic lighter held together with a rubber band. I'm taking off, Heather. I closed the kitchen and left a piece of salty steak in full for your mama. You're a sweetheart, Marvin. I love you. Don't forget it now. I won't. Happy Halloween. If Clyde sees it, then I know, Marvin. I won't forget. I promise. How's she doing anyway? Mama, she's okay. She misses him. We all do. The cook turned to go. Want me to flip the sign on the door? No need, Marvin. I'm right behind you. But there were still things to do, and the sudden quiet was strange and penetrating as though in the absence of people, Heather felt them more. I think that's enough torture um, for you all out there. Thank you. Uh, thank you. That was lovely. And I liked the, the, the uh, accents that you pick up too. That was, we'll, we'll come back around to that, I think. Um, do you want to go ahead and read now, Ed, or? Sure. Yeah, I'll be happy to do that. Uh, first of all, I'll just say thank you, Lynn, for doing this. Uh, I'm so uh, uh, flattered and honored to be reading with you, Simon. Uh, that was fantastic. And uh, I, I will also say that as a Southerner, you know, and I know you've lived in the South uh, for periods of time, so you actually can pull off a Southern accent and, and, it, and it sounds totally authentic. So uh, that is high praise. And you're a, you're a beautiful writer and, and I've admired you for a long time. And thank you for for sharing uh, this time with me. Um, I'm just gonna read us also about the same length of uh, a piece from my novel, uh, The Fortunate Ones, which came out in January. Uh, it's set here in Nashville. Uh, and just to uh, you know, sort of briefly preface what I'm getting into, my narrator uh, uh, is, is a guy who he's talking about his best friend from childhood, a guy named Arch, um, whom he met uh, when they were uh, students at uh, a preparatory school called Yateman. And this is the setting uh, where, where I'll be kind of taken off from uh, with a scene that turned out to be a little bit more uh, timely than I had intended when I wrote it. The last week of May, Arch gave the commencement address at Yateman. Arch knew what a powerful platform the lectern at a Yateman commencement could be, a captive audience which included many of the city's most affluent and influential citizens. He was not naive to the length of his odds. Arch's sole experience in politics had been a term on the school board where his most memorable accomplishment had been a concerted effort to blow the whole thing up. Citing irreconcilable dysfunction and well-intentioned but incompetent members, Arch had sent a letter to the mayor's office and the news media calling for a resolution to disband the elected school board 
and return to a system where the mayor appointed representatives of his own choosing. Speaking as one myself, I believe our school board representatives want what's best for our young people, Arch had written in the letter, but as a whole, we lack the experience, expertise, and available time to accomplish our aims. Off the record, he'd been more blunt. It was an idiot circus, he told me, run by some of the stubbornest jackasses who ever stumbled out of the barn. The initiative died, but its failure turned out to be a boon for Arch. The newspapers painted him as a truth-telling idea man. He didn't have the support of the mayor's office or the city council, but he had the papers, especially the Herald, owned by Engage South, a media company belonging to a Yateman alum. And the television stations could never resist a pretty face. Arch looked like a savior to the white working class, just as disgust with politicians was peaking. Now, how did a guy like Arch Cray, born into wealth, educated privately from pre-K through graduate school, married to the daughter of a billionaire, as handsome as a film star, with family ties going back almost to Jamestown, become a man of the people. After all, the people were the ones who shopped at Walmart, who spent their lives traveling back and forth between backbreaking jobs and weary inertia at home, who ended up being forced to live off disability and Medicaid benefits. How on earth could the people see a guy who lived on Bellmead Boulevard as their champion? There is nothing in this world to which people connect more willingly in uncertain times than the appearance of genuine certainty. If there was one true thing that could be said about Arch, it was this. He seemed so sure of himself that people couldn't help but believe in him. That's it. Thanks. Um, I often like to see the, the sort of themes that the, the book festival staff come up with for, for different conversations. Um, sometimes they're really obvious and sometimes they're less obvious and I'm not sure how obvious or uh, how intentional this was, but it seems to me that, that both of you um, wrote about um, your adopted homes um, and, or were inspired by your adopted homes in, in uh, creating these works. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that or you can say, whoa, no, uh, this is your way out of left field. But that was something that, that seemed interesting to me that um, that you took the voice of the people of communities that you had adopted as homes and lived in for a while and 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 still do live in <laughs> mm -hmm. and and um, and sort of created these stories about them as opposed to the the trope of, the, you know, write what you know. Right. Um, Ed, Simon, um, please. I I, I, <laughs> I I just did the talk, and I'd love to hear. I'm I'm actually I wrote down some questions for you myself, and that was pretty. That was one that I was curious about too. So that, that's a that's a really nice question, Lynn. Um, the um, in terms of like writing, for me, it, it's very easy because I don't really choose what to write. It sort of chooses me in the way that so I have the same luck choosing what to write as I have the same luck choosing what to dream. Um, and that's, uh, that's one of the hard things about being a writer is that um, I think, you know, I could write something that might be of the moment and might be more commercially successful. But if my subconscious wants me to write about the relationship between an old man and a mouse, then that's what I shall do. Um, so I really trust in the imagination in terms of what to write rather than because I think writing other people's stories enables a type of empathy and compassion. So I think that's enormously interesting. I mean, um, Ishiguro, he's Japanese. He's not an English butler. So um, I, I can understand, you know, the pushback on things like write what you know. But I think, you know, each case should be considered individually. Just as my opinion, which is worth nothing, really. So um, but I moved to Kentucky when I was 17. Um, I wanted a very different experience of life than I'd had uh, in England. And um, I got it. And um, I never felt more um hugged you know emotionally physically than i had in kentucky i mean i just couldn't believe how warm and kind people were um but then i also there was another side of, of people's lives that was despair you know alcoholism and disenfranchisement and unemployment and uh you know um, in some cases religious fanaticism um so i really saw a very interesting side of people and of course um you know the racial question which is big deal in America, you know, as it should be. So 
um, I just lived my life as I, as best I could, and I met people, and I, I loved people, and I felt like I was loved back in an unconditional way. And um, I, I just hadn't had that experience with communities before. Um, I, I just couldn't believe it. I loved it. I mean, I love Kentucky. Um, and uh, so I made friends with the family when I was 17, and now I'm 47 almost. And so um, for 30 years, you know, they've been telling me their stories, and I've been visiting them and we've been sharing meals and life events. And um, I mean, I really love these people. I, and so when I wrote, wanted to write their family stories, there were bits that they didn't know. And so I had to make those bits up like little bridges. Um, so that's why I couldn't really call it a memoir for this particular family because of those, those missing pieces. So um, I, 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 they didn't read it until the book came out. So I was a bit nervous. Um, because I'm touching on some very deep emotional things for them, but um, but I, I think they they like it and they like that their stories are out there in the world. Um, so it's worked out quite well. I just this is sort of a love letter really to Kentucky. I mean, I just I just really felt so moved. I just I think a part of me is I don't know what I don't know. Ed's probably going to answer this question much better. I'm sure he will. <laughs> But, um, you know, it seemed unlikely that somebody from England, you know, would, would come to and write a story about people in Kentucky. But um, I think it's not so much about the physical, um, the physical sort of logistics, but more about the emotional and spiritual. I think there's something spiritual going on that we just don't know about. And uh, I think that there's some something happening. And I just... A part of me is from Kentucky. I feel in some ways a Kentuckian, much as I feel like I'm British. So, um, yeah. So That's a great answer. I was really, I was curious <laughs> about that myself. And uh, that's just so beautifully put. And um, I, I can say for my part, I, 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 I do not feel like a Tennessean, even though I've lived here for 15 years. Uh, and and maybe that was part of what attracted me, you know, sort of sort of an inverse of Simon's experience where he felt, you know, like this is really sort of a place that, you know, I feel am, that I am from in some way. And I think that for me, it, it, it was more the opposite of even though I've lived here longer than anywhere I've lived in my life, except for my you know childhood home, I still feel sort of amazed and dazzled by things that I see and experience here. And I just, I, I, from the moment I came here, one thing that I think is totally identical about Simon's and my experience is that uh, from the moment I arrived in Tennessee, I felt like I was in a, a, a kinder place than I'd ever lived before. And I mean, just when it, even driving down the highway, you know, people kind of let you in when they're coming off the off ramp, which has not happened, you know, where I came from. And, you know, people when go into the gas station to, you know, get a drink after we fill up the tank on the way to where we were living, you know, give me a blessed day. And I just thought, gosh, everybody's really like, they're really nice. And I did, you know, I, I don't know that I necessarily have ever felt completely at home, but I have felt welcomed. Um, and so I love it. And at the time that I started writing this book, I thought this was the time when Nashville really started to get in the national news media a lot. And, it, you know, where all these things were being written about, you know, the I was living in East Nashville at the time, which was like the cool hip place that was always in the New York Times. And we'd always joke around about, you know, when some new restaurant that was really cool would open up, we'd be like, please don't write about it, New York Times, because then it's going to be really hard to get a table, <laughs> which inevitably happened. Uh, and then there was a TV show, which, uh, you know, was kind of a, a big deal for a while there. And so I just sort of thought, oh, I'm going to write a book about Nashville that is what it's really like, right? And TV show is not what it's like at all. And I don't know if that was a, you know, the smartest or, 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 or safest decision, but by the time I uh, really started to think about it, I was, you know, under contract, so I had to finish it. Uh, <laughs> and uh, again, I, I still do. I, when I started, I thought, you know, this could really be happening anywhere, especially in the South. Uh, the kind of dynamics that I'm writing about, it just is a convenient thing for me to, to write about a place that I'm really interested in that fascinates me. But now I don't think that it really could have been anywhere else because I think Nashville really is in a lot of ways um, 
you know, a sort of, I don't know, what's the word that people use, uh, uh, sort of a bellwether um, in terms of, of the South, because we've had, we've got such a, I mean, I'm one of the people who moved here from, from out of state. Uh, and then you've got kind of the old genteel Southern population, and then you've got kind of the rising, uh, you know, uh, what used to sort of be the, the underclass of the proletariat that's now your kind of, you know, upper middle class. And, and, and it's pretty, you know, we, we tend to tilt democratic and city elections, but it's not like there aren't a lot of conservatives in Nashville. And, and so all of the tensions that seem to be sort of building in U S culture uh, and, and really in a kind of critical way have been simmering here ever since I got here. And I think that, you know, it turned out for me to be a very convenient way to write about how those things get into the lives of just, you know, normal people. And um, because what I'm really more interested in anything else is this character and emotion, and which is exactly kind of what Simon was talking about. And, and so what I wanted to see was, you know, how these kind of dramatic political or social or cultural things, what they matter, how they matter in the lives of, you know, you and me. Um, and that was, you know, convenient for me and I'm, I'm proud of where it ended up and fortunately uh no one has uh told me to my face that i got it wrong so uh that's that's where i am uh well i yeah i my response response to that i went to harpeth hall the private independent college preparatory school for girls so right. uh you got a lot of it right eerily right and then there were parts and i was like oh no that's something different so it was <laughs> it was uh it was fun to read in that it it uh recognizing things and then recognizing you know the fiction part right hopefully a lot of fiction 100 <laughs> um, percent. yeah uh, but and and uh both of of the books uh dealt with racial issues of, of, in a way of their time. Um, uh, and looking back on it, it's obviously different than what we're working towards now. Um, but that, that was another thing that I thought was interesting in, in um, the progress and the, the touchstones of racial issues that both of your uh, books um, addressed. <laughs> yeah, that's very true. <laughs> uh, I, and I, it may have just been me, but for example, that there were reference in in the in Simon and in, in your uh, in your book, it, it there were discussions about racism, or there were acknowledgement of the racism that was happening in the early part of the twentieth century. That yeah. it, it just. Um, well, how, how did, how did you, how were you able to present that so that it, it wasn't uh, looking at it from today's perspective? Um, well, I tried to present it in the sense of, um, in the sense of, I mean, I've experienced both. I mean, in America, I'm as British as um, rhubarb and custard, right? Um, but in Britain, I mean, my grandmother is an immigrant from Jamaica. So I, I, my whole family experienced racism growing up, but I mean, it's not something I really write about because, you know, I, uh, it's not something that really defines who I am in a sense, if that, you know, um, it's that they'll always be hateful people and that's who they are. And I, I don't really want to involve myself with them. So, um, so, you know, growing up in some cases was not easy, um, and uh, and then when I moved to Kentucky, of course, I don't laugh or mock me, but my dream was to be an American football player. And mm -hmm. um, I know I'm small; you can't see, but I'm I'm under average height. And um, and uh, you know, it was my dream was dashed when I saw these like these amazing, like muscular, like fast, like brilliant athletic men, you know, who outclassed me physically in every way. But as you know, football teams are very diverse. Um, and so being uh, 
you know, being on the team from Britain was sort of a novelty for a lot of the other players. Um, they're like, you should be on the soccer team. What are you doing here? And I was like, oh, I don't like soccer very much. You know, I like running around in, in, in these all, in this always plastic gear and jumping on people. I love that. So um, I would go home with a lot of the different players at the weekends. So my, my friends were like, it represented America. And I got to see almost every neighborhood in Kentucky. Um, you know, and it was, it was so, you know, I heard stories from parents and grandparents when I'd, I'd go home because I'm British. So they would tell me this is what it was like here in the 50s. This is what it's like now. And so a lot of that went into the book. So in a sense, the book is me serving my readers, serving the people of Kentucky and telling the stories that were told to me and not imposing any of my own views. Because my own views are, I mean, I don't really put any importance on my opinions or views because they're constantly changing as I learn. So I try not to hold opinions because otherwise I feel like I'm an idiot, more of an idiot than I already am. So um, really this book was taking all the stories that have been told to me by every be friends of mine who are Cherokee and who are now like drilling um, oil lines in, you know, you know, out in Oklahoma and uh, everybody I met and I, I feel like they trusted their stories to me. And I, my, my goal was to have a novel which really represented a cross section of people in Kentucky and told their stories in, in, in an authentic way without any kind of um, hidden objective on my part, if that makes sense. I think for uh, for my part, uh, I, I share a lot of uh, similarities with Simon in terms of, you know, I, I, I think when I was, you know, if you had asked me five or six years ago or 10 years ago, you know, uh, I would have said that I had a lot uh, stronger opinions about those particular issues, the, 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 the race issues that you're addressing. And my strongest opinion now is that guys like me should be listening more than talking and really trying to be sensitive to, you know, the perspective and experience of people who have not really had a voice for the majority of, you know, the history of our country and its politics. And there was kind of a breaking point for me. I, I, I was in a, a, a panel at a, a book festival after Only Love Can Break Your Heart came out. It was about Southern fiction today was the name of the panel. And, you know, it was a great panel with a bunch of people that I really admired. Uh, uh, including uh, the late Brad Watson, whose book is right behind me there, the blue one. Uh, and uh, I really encourage you, anybody out there, if you haven't read Brad, to check him out. Uh, sort of a hero of mine. Uh, passed away uh, not this past summer, but the year before. And, uh, you know, I was so proud just to be on a panel with, you know, my hero, you know, it was like, you know, being for a writer, for, for, for me anyway, it felt like being invited to open up for Elvis or something like that. Uh, and at the end of the panel, somebody in the back sort of stood up and said, you know, what do you think it says about Southern fiction today that uh, the this panel consists, you know, of five white males and one person of color and one woman, and that's the same person. And of course, my initial reaction to that was, well, you're asking the wrong people because we didn't organize the panel. I mean, we just showed up and uh, none of us really wanted to be standard bearers of Southern fiction. And it just seemed like a, probably for the festival organizers, a convenient way of organizing, you know, these books that were all coming out at the same time. And, and for, you know, okay, well, all these people are Southern, we'll just stick them together and it's just circumstantial. But given the situation, I mean, it was kind of one of those moments where I was like, okay, why am I so, why, why does this question make me feel so uncomfortable? And I thought about it for a long time and it kind of hung in my head and I, I talked to a lot of people about it and, and it got me to thinking about how, you know, you know, that type of voice, the voice that, you know, fits that, the demographic to which I belong, it's kind of, you know, dominated the conversation in literature since its inception. Uh, and, and I wanted to address, you know, kind of the, 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 the social and systemic and political dynamics around that. But I also recognize that I'm not the person to speak for, you know, other people's experience. So I tried to do that in the way that I addressed it. I don't think you can write about politics in the South without acknowledging this dynamic. It's really important, mm -hmm. particularly when you're talking about 
you know, trying to get votes out. Um, but I wanted to do it in a way that, you know, didn't, wasn't so much about trying to take the voice of another, uh, you know, another type of person, but to examine the culture that creates the type of person who assumes that his way of doing things is, is the right way and that everybody's supposed to get on board with him. So that was kind of really where I tried to go at it more like, you know, how do, how, how do guys like me start thinking that ours ought to be the loudest voice in the room all the time? Um, and since I'm talking about how guys like me shouldn't talk so much, I'm going to stop talking. <laughs> Well, why don't you uh, why don't you uh, ask one of your questions, Ed, for for Simon? Just keep Simon well, on the hot seat. Yeah. Uh, one thing that I thought was really interesting about your book was how you, and it makes a little bit more sense now that I know that it came out of this family history of these people that you were really close with and that you love. But this this kind of First off, you got these alternating chronologies, which one question I was curious about was, did you write them simultaneously or one at a time? And then secondly, uh, the sort of juxtaposition of pain and redemption, of trauma and grace, you know, how you have these sort of really, really brutally painful stuff uh, right next to, you know, these really, you know, lovely moments of the kind of warmth and goodness that you were talking about. Kind of maybe if you could talk a little bit about that and how that came about and what your intentions were with that. I'd love to hear it. I'm always like fumbling with the mute, unmute, mute, yeah. the unmute button. Um, yeah, that's a very good, very good question. Uh, the, uh, I, I suppose I wanted to, I mean, the narrators really chose me um, mm -hmm. in the sense that when I started writing the stories down, I just felt an emotional and spiritual connection to certain voices. Um, and I'm very open-minded about things like reincarnation or God or gods or anything. I mean, I don't know anything or say anything certain, but I'm definitely open to things, right? So um, who knows what's happening? One of my favorite writers, Claire Keegan in Ireland, said, mm -hmm. if a story chooses you, if you don't start writing it, it will choose someone else. Um, so I like that idea that we get channeled because there's so many things that seem like coincidences, but are they coincidences? Or is there just some kind of, um, you know, pattern that we just can't see or understand or, you know. Um, anyway, so I chose these two narrators, Carol and her grandson, Sam, and um, who are based on, on real people, of course. And Sam is alive and he might even be watching this. So uh, your mother said, cut your hair, Sam. And cut your hair. <laughs> um, but uh, <laughs> uh, so... Oh, uh oh, I'm forgetting what the question was. Oh, I think I remember. Um, so I wrote Carol's story and then I, I actually alternated. I didn't write them in one long, but one editor who I really admire here in New York said, um, Simon, you should maybe stick with one point of view because it really gives the reader a nice uninterrupted emotional connection. And, but then I would have lost showing two childhoods 50 years apart in America. So that's what I wanted to do. So you see, we start with Carol in 1933 or 19, uh, in the 1930s. And then we have her grandson, Samuel, in the 1980s. So I wanted to show how it was to grow up in Kentucky, 50 years apart. Um, and then, and then uh, you know, halfway through the book, they merge and the reader learns that, you know, Samuel is Carol's grandson. Um, and, they, you know, they don't really have a good relationship because Carol is a very damaged person. Um, and I suppose the idea of redemption and pain is that, you know, when I look at my family history, I mean, it's, it's a bit of a nightmare, actually. And when I ask friends of mine about their family history, mm, it's a bit of a nightmare. And, um, but there are these people who, in the family, who kind of are holding everything together, you know. And, um, and so this idea of what family should be like and how our lives should be like, I mean... I don't know, I think we've all been conned by advertising and television because the reality is life is very hard and full of suffering. And if we don't have suffering now, it's in the mail. Um, and the only thing we've got is each other and those moments, everyday moments where we just do kind of nice things for each other. And um, so my book, people say they criticize me sometimes for having happy endings in my books, but if you don't make a happy ending in your life, you're not gonna get one. 
it, it, you really have to like, um, I think the default position is not comfort, luxury and happiness. I think it's suffering and despair and loneliness. So it's about my, my characters, just like members of my family have and people I know, they've just made a real commitment to creating stability and happiness and a kind of comfort for people who haven't been able to get it for themselves. So, um, yeah. Do you think uh, just on the outside looking in as a, as a writer, as somebody who's, you know, lived most really probably at this point, most of your, would you say more than half of your life in the States or, or yeah, actually, actually, yeah. Um, that you, I mean, is it a uniquely American problem? This idea that we're all supposed to be happy? Oh, I think so. I think so because um, what you know, I think America's greatest export, of course, is music. You know, mm -hmm. blues, jazz, rock and roll, hip hop. America is creates music, and the world loves it. Um, but I also think TV is a big export. I mean, I grew up watching. I grew up in a village in Wales. Okay, watching the Dukes of Hazard. Like <laughs> that's kind of weird, right? And um, and just bizarre things like T.J. Hooker and Street Hawk, mm -hmm. all the a Nut Rider, God, I love that. And um, and uh, so you, know, you have this you have this kind of fantasy about what America's like. But when I got here, I was like, oh, it was better and worse than I imagined. Mm -hmm. Actually, people were much nicer and warmer than I had ever known people could be. But also there were all, there was a lot of um, sort of toxicity in the culture, um, you know, the ways that men are supposed to define themselves. It just doesn't lead to happiness, you know. Right. Um, so I think, um, yeah, and I, but I think, uh, yes, that's, that's yeah, that's, uh, I've sort of lost my train of thought, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's great. Um, maybe I could ask you a question, Ed. Sure. Um, I am really obsessed with other writers' processes. Mm -hmm. Now, you're really prolific. Uh. So I'm wondering, like, do you have a certain time? What do you eat before you write? Do you have a certain desk? Like, what are the conditions under which you create, like, your work environment? And how, how, how many hours do you work a day? Do you work every day? Like, I'm really curious about your writing process. Um, well... You know, I bet we're not that far apart because I actually had seen an interview with you online where you had talked about this very question. And uh, I, I get up really get up early, early, early in the morning and I try to write, you know, a couple hours before my kids get up and before, you know, I have to go to work. Uh, I'm also in the position of, you know, you got to kind of work it around the needs of, you know, your family. And I mean, I know a lot of writers who, who you know, are, are lucky enough to just be able to work, work full time, but I'm not one of them. And I don't want my family to be the ones who are suffering. So it's I just get up early. I, I, I don't I, I get in the bed or I lie on the couch and I, I have learned I used to be a person who needed a sanctuary. Uh, but then I figured out that's just never going to work for me. I just got to be able to sit down and go wherever I have a chance to go. And sometimes if I have an hour at work, I'll, I'll you know, pick it up and, and go some more. But I, I am really, I do think that, and maybe, you know, I'd be interested to hear what you have to say about it, that after you've been at it long enough, like when I was an apprentice writer, kind of working my way up to the Gladwell 10,000 hours, I really did need a more disciplined environment. And I needed a kind of a ramp, like a warm up, like I'd have to sit there and read for a while or meditate or, 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 or whatever, have rituals. But once I got to that point where I felt like I was in shape, uh, I, don't, I don't really need that anymore. I can just kind of go. And I don't worry that much about if it's bad because I know I'm going to have to change it later anyway. Mm. That's really interesting. So you know that the magic will come out, say, in a later draft. So you don't mm -hmm. have the crisis that, you know, a lot of writers have early on where they're, they're, they're obsessed with the first draft. You get the first mm -hmm. draft written knowing that the magic will come out. Like you can, yeah. Well, I mean, I'm curious, but like for you, like how, how, how much different did, 
is your printed book from your first completed draft of the novel very like different in terms of, very I mean, different. like go ahead and Go ahead, I took my first draft, put them in someone else's trash can. That's how bad they are. <laughs> I mean, I think mine is a third shorter than the, the 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 printed book is a third shorter than than the first draft. And I, I mean, if for, if anyone's out there watching or watches this later, that is a you know a, a, an apprentice writer that's you know wanting advice, my advice to you on this particular subject would be: don't get stuck on one page because you're going to have to change it anyway. Just go, just keep going, and you know come back and fix it later because you know 99% chance that your first page isn't going to be the first page of of the book when it's the best version of itself that you hope somebody will you know pick up and read yeah yeah that's good really good advice mm -hmm. i'm actually going to take that advice that helps me <laughs> <laughs> well we have had one question from our our viewing audience which is uh how has have the past 18 months in the pandemic influenced your writing or your uh future projects if, if there's been any and surely it's done something if not had presented you with all of these wonderful online opportunities. <laughs> mm -hmm. mm. Um, that's a good question. Uh, Ed, would you like to, or would you like me to start? You go first, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I mean, um, we were, I'm in, you know, New York City. So it's like, it's chaotic most of the time. You know, wake up, have my coffee. Oh, look, someone's driving on the sidewalk again. <laughs> um, you know, and uh, the squirrels are like running after me because they know I've got a chocolate bar in my pocket. So, you know, it's typical New York. Um, but during the pandemic, of course, we were all inside. And um, and I, I really need, I have some learning issues where I find it very hard to focus. I find it very hard not to get obsessed with certain things. So, for instance, if I'm writing and then I'm thinking about, oh, I wonder if... Um, what the weather is and I just quickly look it up and then I wonder well I wonder what it was this time last year and I wonder what, what it was this time two years ago on this particular day and then would that change with the particular longitude so I become very distracted by something else and so um the, in the pandemic it was like okay I have to rethink my writing you know schedule so uh, I got some of those really big sunglasses that very old people wear in Las Vegas you know that they put over their glasses <laughs> they got the hat that says the USS Ulysses and stuff like that. So I got a pair of those glasses. And um, someone once said, do you have a Winnebago? And I was, I didn't know what Winnebago was. So I just said, yeah. And, um, but I got those, I got earplugs. I got those things that people wear, you know, uh, when they're like doing loud things. And, um, you know, I, my wife agreed to not come into the bedroom from eight o'clock to, to noon. And then I'd go out and make lunch and take it to my wife and daughter on trays. And uh, we have a pet mouse. So I take him his seed on a little tray. And um, so we had this sort of schedule, but I couldn't really write anything new. I had to, I, So I just edited manuscripts that were like, you know, first and second drafts that needed to become third, fourth, fifth drafts. So I spent the pandemic editing. Um, but of course, it's very sad because people died. Uh, my uncle died. My wife's aunt died. And um, you realize that it, if it wasn't the modern, if it wasn't 2021, we might be dead. You know, I, I, have a, I had pneumonia a couple of years ago in both lungs. And if I'd got it this year, it might have been me who died. So, you know, it really, you really realize after all the anecdotal things that it's, it was very serious. And so I feel very lucky and grateful. And, um, but writing wise, it was just a matter of adjust, adjustment, which seemed small compared to other people who, who, especially the people who had to go out to work and drive the trains every day and put themselves at risk, you know, and EMTs. So. Yeah, I, um, I, I, of course it's impacted me. I, and I, 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 I think it's impacted everyone who's, you know, an empathetic person. I, I, I was, I was talking uh, to my wife the other day about how I'm trying to resolve this tension between a desire to be informed and a desire not to go insane. 
because if you read the news all day long, you know, you, 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 it, it'll just drive you crazy and make you anxious and make you angry. Uh, you know, my book came out, the, the fortunate ones on January 5th, hmm. January 5th. And so, you know, the, the, the day of my, uh, the day after my book came out, you know, was the storming of the Capitol. <clears throat> and, uh, that was a bizarre time to be rolling a book out, particularly under these conditions. Mm -hmm. And the thing for me was that, uh, you know, and I think this is something that maybe gets a little bit lost in the conversation is that both the good and the bad things in life did not stop happening because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, many, many, many people were impacted by the COVID pandemic. But uh, for instance, I got engaged and married during the pandemic, or I got engaged right before the pandemic started. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, 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 we had a, you know, a COVID wedding in July outside with a limited number of people. And, um, and it was really beautiful. And I think in a lot of ways, it might have been more beautiful and meaningful because of the way that that had to happen. But a month after I got engaged, uh, my brother-in-law of 20 years uh, was diagnosed with stage four colon cancer. And, you know, it was, you know, I, I'm living through this time where, you know, one of the most beautiful and amazing things that has ever happened to me is going on. Meanwhile, you know, absolute number one with the bullet, worst thing that's ever happened in my family is going on. And my sister and 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 my niece and nephew my, and nephews are, are, you know, and, and my brother-in-law are going through, you know, uh, you know, a terrible, terrible tragedy. Uh, uh, you know, m many, many people get a reprieve there. Unfortunately, that was not the case for my brother-in-law. Um, we lost him in August. And all of the, you know, everything with the pandemic for me was happening around these two huge major life events, one of which is just full of joy, one of which is full of sorrow and, and, and anxiety and, and hope, but also, you know, dashed hopes. And, and, um, and then in the middle of all of that, you know, you got what's going on in the news, which for, for many, many, many families, that was the, the tragedy, that was the crisis, that was the thing. Uh, but, you know, life didn't cease because of that and you know in, in, in good or bad ways completely unrelated to, to COVID-19 or politics and that was really bracing for me but also I, I you know my lack of productivity or my you know scattershot productivity over the past 18 months has way less to do with the COVID pandemic than it does with these other things. And I think that there are probably a lot of people out there who are in the same situation where, you know, their, uh, you know, their relative who's struggling with depression or illness or, or some other sort of tragedy didn't stop happening because of quarantine. In fact, a lot, a lot of times it got worse uh, and people fell in love and people had kids and, and there was great joy and, um, you know, I think it's it's something that I, I now see as being, you know, a, a really important lesson for me about how no matter how bad things are going, you know, in the news, the the the, the things that happen in the house, the things that happen to the people who love each other, they're still happening, and that has nothing to do with, you know, what's on the cover of the New York Times. Mm -hmm. That's beautifully put, Ed. Oh, uh, I'm so sorry for your loss. Yes. Thank you. The one thing I'll say about about the news, the newspapers, is um, I haven't picked up a newspaper for about seventeen years, uh, <laughs> and I haven't watched TV news TV for about the same time because it just makes I couldn't be a writer and be informed. So, for instance, my wife thinks that's quite irresponsible of me. No, I don't read any newspapers. I don't like them, and I don't like any TV except you know shows on Netflix, stuff like that. But no network stuff and because it makes me very anxious very nervous it kind of fires me up one way or another but I'm not, you know you know, so I, I can't write books and live in the books and have the drama of the characters and have that too i also feel like i'm being manipulated and so because they'll say like i overhear sometimes if i'm in a, a restaurant they'll say you know 
you know, new virus sweeping the new, not virus, bad example, but the new trend sweeping social media for kids, what you need to know to keep your kids safe after the break. So you've got to watch commercials, get to something that could potentially save your kids' lives. That feels to me very manipulating. So, but that's just my opinion. So I don't like any newspapers, any TV. I, I just, I, I read, I play video games and, um, I watch some shows on on, on, on Netflix, you know, but um, but if anything important happens, my wife tells me, or I actually see it from the window. Like there was a car floating down the street a couple of weeks ago because of some like really big storm and literally the car was floating down the street. So um, yeah, I, a lot of writers say to me, what do you do about the anxiety of like, I'm like, look, you can't do everything. Some people know how to do CPR, some people don't. Some people know about this, some people don't. There's only a certain amount of time in the world, I think. You know, so you've got to figure out what it is that inspires you. Simon, I think when I get off of this, uh, the first thing that my wife is going to say to me is, don't ever read a newspaper again. Be like Simon. <laughs> so, you know, if your wife says you're irresponsible, mine would be like, no, be like that guy. Quit reading the news. So. Um, well, I think I think that's the note we end on this afternoon. Um, is just stop reading the news and and read some good books. Like, that's like, right. <laughs> like these two, the fortunate ones, which we have here, and um, uh, Night Came with Many Stars. So, uh, good reads to uh, avoid the news for sure. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for being here, both of you, remotely, and um, hopefully we'll see you next year on the plaza uh, live and in person um be great. i'd like to thank everybody for joining us this afternoon and thank the festival sponsors metro nashville arts commission ingram content group tennessee arts commission vanderbilt university and parnassus books where you can purchase the books if you haven't already and um we'll see you next year thank you so much lynn thanks lynn thank you, it's my pleasure thanks, my pleasure really. sixth year